Welcome everyone back to the, uh, to the third session on the, the Edge Cloud Continuum. Um, our first speaker in this session is uh, Kishore from Georgia Tech. Uh, he's a professor at Georgia Tech and his uh, research interests there uh, span uh, architectural uh, uh, analysis, programming, uh, parallel and distributed systems, and uh, you know, I looked up his web page. It's a very long list of awards, which I'm sure if I start listing, will eat into his uh, talk time, which I don't want to do. So yeah, I'll just uh, I'll just stop and 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 let him. Uh, let's hear from Kishu. Well, thanks, Kanish. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, uh, the, and it's turned on, but you know they have they have to cue it at some yeah, point. Just for the recording. Oh, the recording. Okay, that's not okay. Um, so uh, uh, thanks for. Uh, Holding up till the almost to the end, uh, uh, we still have one more session to go. So today I'll talk about you know um, uh, how we can make the peer, uh, the uh, edge a peer of the cloud, um, and uh, and um, uh, I'm giving the talk, but uh, uh, my students are responsible for all the slides, <laughs> and uh, uh, so let's see how I go with that. Uh, so I think you know the, the preliminary slides I can sort of uh, uh, just run through. IoT is there. Lots of IoT applications, we talked about that. And future internet applications um, uh, that, that ride on IoT, uh, they'll have this characteristic, of course, that there is sensing, processing, and actuation. And common characteristics dealing with real-world data streams, real-time interaction, wide area analytics, um, and the need for dynamic scalability, uh, low latency communication, uh, efficient in-network processing. All of these are, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. Um, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, cloud computing, as we know it today, is good for web apps, uh, which are uh, uh, working at human perception speeds, and, um, and they are throughput oriented. But they're not so good for many latency sensitive applications, uh, which IoT characterizes, uh, which are happening at computational perception speeds. And uh, what uh, uh, Suman was talking about earlier with respect to uh, connected vehicles and so on and so forth. And, um, and so the, the, the sense process actuation is happening at computational perception speeds. And that's uh, 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 one of the main things that, uh, that cloud computing uh, is, is incapable of supporting at this point. And there are other considerations some of which uh, we heard uh, uh, from the keynote speech, um, uh, uh, the fact that uh, there may be privacy uh, considerations, there may be um, uh, IP protection considerations. All of these are, are asking for um, uh, regulated requirements. They, they, they also uh, play into why uh, cloud may not be uh, appropriate for everything that we want to do with IoT. So enter... Uh, fog and edge computing, hierarchical, geo-distributed, and uh, this will please uh, 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 Victor because I am showing several different levels <laughs> in the hierarchy. And uh, uh, so, where, where are we with a uh, fog? You don't like? I know. I know. You, uh, that's why I, I added uh, edge also. So there is fog and edge. <laughs> um, so, so you know, where, where are we with respect to uh, this edge computing today? Well, you know, it's still a slave of the cloud. Um, and uh, so, for instance, if I want to send a message to you, I still have to, you know, I have a mobile device, I have a mobile, you have a mobile device, I have to go to the cloud and come back down to you, right? So we are sort of beholden uh, 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 to the cloud uh, in that sense. And um, so what I'm thinking as a vision for the future is that uh, uh, the edge uh, uh, should become a peer of the cloud. And, and, and so we want to elevate the edge to the peer of the cloud. And in the limit, what I would like to be able to say is that, well, even if I don't have connectivity to the cloud, I should be able to do things um, without any reliance on. And this was something that uh, Rashmi uh, this morning mentioned, that you know, offline, uh, how do you, uh, what are the challenges uh, when you have offline? So, so these are all the things that I want to talk about. What are the challenges here? Well, uh, the, one of the reasons why uh, cloud has uh, really taken our lives um, is the fact that there are powerful uh, frameworks that exist in the cloud that make it extremely easy. Uh, I wouldn't say extremely easy, but it, it allows uh, development of complex applications um, all the way from um, you know, programming models like Spark, um, uh, storage abstractions, NoSQL databases, and, um, and pub subsystems like uh, uh, Kafka and so on. Right? Um, so all of these things make it very powerful. 
And um, so, uh, uh, and, and, and we need similar abstractions, uh, similar frameworks at the edge in order to be able to doing, doing the things that we want to do in an autonomous fashion at the edge. And so uh, that, uh, then also there is uh, the, the, the need for uh, data replication in order to provide for fault tolerance. Easy to do in the, in the cloud because you have data centers, lots of resources, and you can do that. And, and most of the time that you're worried about, uh, what you're worried about if a power failures, it's usually one rack that might fail. You can, you can, you can replicate it in another rack, and hopefully you'll be fine. So uh, that's that kind of thing that, that happens in the, um, uh, in, in, um, uh, in the cloud. Uh, you have to do, the, do that same kind of data replication uh, in, in the edge worrying about the heterogeneity that exists in the networks, and also uh, 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 being resilient to coordinated uh, power failures. I mean, an entire area uh, may fail, and, and so if you replicate it too close together, then you've lost all the copies, right? So those are things that you have to worry about, and, and you have to worry about um, how do you rapidly uh, uh, deploy application components, uh, uh, multi-tenancy, uh, and elasticity at the edge, recognizing that you have limited computational networking and storage resources. So these are the challenges, and uh, my group, uh, uh, the students that I, that I mentioned in the beginning, um, they're working on different aspects of it. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to give you uh, uh, sort of a, uh, um, uh, a panoramic view of some of the projects that are ongoing um, that touches on uh, some of these things. And, and feel free to interrupt at any point. Uh, uh, okay, so, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He asked. Yeah, he, absolutely. He asked for it. Yeah, he asked. I was thinking. Well, you were looking like you wanted to interrupt, so I said, well, <laughs> might as well let you. <laughs> I was politely listening. Anyway, yeah. so, uh, so Azure has this thing called Azure Stack. Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Yeah. And basically, there's a multiple of servers, and you can buy it from Dell and HP and other companies. And um, one of the visions there is that you should be able to run anything that you run on Azure Cloud, you can run on that. Yeah. So this thing can sit, that can be your edge. So where, is your, so where is your edge? Then haven't you achieved all the goals if everything that runs on cloud runs on this thing as well? Well, what I want yeah. is, uh, you know, the, all the communication is between the Azure Edge and the cloud, right? And I want horizontal communication as well. Even if I, you know, right now it has to go to the cloud and back down to other edges, but right? You, you want to have a, you, but you want to have some justification for that, right? I'll do so, that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, so I'm going to tell you about um, uh, programming models. So the, one of the things that we've looked at is geo-distributed programming model for the edge cloud continuum, um, and the need need for having to not necessarily talk hierarchically between the cloud and the edge, but uh, uh, horizontally between the edges, and. Um, uh, and there is a uh, uh, there is a Foglitz work that we did uh, uh, earlier, and then the other thing that you want to do is geo distributed data replication. And uh, so uh, here is uh, uh, where you want to make sure that uh, there are no coordinated fail power failures that will affect uh, all of the data replicas. And so we have a couple of things that uh, that we have done in that space, and uh, and then applications that use an autonomous um, uh, uh, edge. Uh, so for instance, uh, we we've, we've um, uh, uh, built a system called STTR, which is uh, space-time trajectory registration um, uh, of uh, all the vehicles um, uh, that, you, that, 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 that are on the roadways. And, um, and, and social sensing, even when the cloud is not available. So these are some of the snippets of things that I'll uh, just rapidly mention. And, and we can take it up in, in, uh, in more detail if you're interested. So first, let me talk about foglets. Uh, the idea is, you know, you give me a data flow graph that consists of sensors uh, and processing that needs to happen on the sensors and actuation, and the sensors may be geo-distributed um, if you take a city-scale uh, environment, or it could be that you have connected vehicles, and, and the vehicles themselves are not stationary, they're moving, and so moving sensors, so th those are things that, that becomes your input, so data flow graph, and, um, and you give a, a quality of service uh, a requirement in terms of latency properties that you associate with the communication between these application components, and what Foglets will do is it, it, it will appropriately place the application components at different levels of the, um, uh, of this, um, uh, hierarchy 
hierarchy uh, going from uh, all the way to the uh, sensors to the uh, uh, to the cloud and and uh, um, and it provides event handlers uh, for communication between uh, the levels uh, both horizontally as well as uh, uh, vertically and uh, and it is and and because a, a sensor uh, which may be mobile um, uh, it can move to a different location. The fog node that was, or the edge node, as uh, uh, Victor would like me to say it, um, uh, that was processing it may not be the appropriate one to continue the computation. And in which case, you may have to, uh, 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 to find a, uh, a different edge node uh, to continue the computation. And that discovery is part of the fogless programming uh, model that will discover what are the resources that are close to uh, where you are. And, uh, and it will transparently do the state migration that is required. And the way we do that is there is a spatiotemporal KV store um, that is part of the programming model. And all the breadcrumbs that you have left over here, you can access that. Um, and, and, and what we do is we have hand, uh, uh, migration that happens, uh, uh, both the computation as well as the state. And that can happen uh, proactively. If you, uh, uh, in the case of uh, a vehicle moving in a particular direction, you can say predict that, oh, this is the direction that it is going and she can proactively migrate it or reactively migrate it if you find that a particular edge node is oversubscribed in terms of resources, then you can uh, 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 do that as well. And um, so just to summarize what uh, Foglitz provides you, it provides you uh, uh, this, uh, this ability to take a, a sense, process, actuate um, application as a data flow graph uh, with le uh, SLAs uh, in terms of latency, and then map them onto uh, this fog infrastructure, right? And um, <clears throat> the and it also does auto discovery of uh, uh, resources uh, that are close to where. Uh, uh, the computation has to take place and migration of the application components and the spatial temporal uh, KV store for sta stashing um, uh, uh, the state of the, uh, uh, of the computation. And there is multi tenancy in the fog, uh, fog nodes via virtualization. So that's sort of the summary of foglets. I'm, I'm willing to answer any questions regarding that. So that, does that make you feel a little better? You don't so, what is it that you're not liking about this? I so, the you know, justification yeah. for, you know, the, the, the idea is if I want so, to so do... Wait, so, so the, at the highest level, the yeah. only thing that you're trying to do is yeah. to uh, remove the dependence to cloud. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, I don't know if that is... Uh, so, the cloud is a lot more than just uh, uh, storage. Right. Correct? Mm -hmm. Now, for example, you're getting data from 100 different sources sure. and your, your nodes are sort of bringing that yeah. up. You kind of sort of bring it in. You've got all these, like... You know, uh, there's there's a lot of investment in all these machine learning algorithms, all the uh, databases, all right. the other stuff, right? Right, right. So it's already there. It already works. Uh -huh. It's, I mean, you know, I would be more actually open if you say, well, I want to do a system which can connect to any cloud. I, mean, I can sort of, like, it's uncomfortable, but I can digest that. But to sort of say that all this massive investment and all this stuff that works, yeah. And I don't see, like... No, your keynote, you your talk situation. this morning, you say, mentioned a bunch, bunch of micro data centers, right? Yeah. And in fact, you predicted or uh, uh, hypothesized that in the future, there are going to be a lot more micro data centers. Yeah. I'm saying that those micro data centers need to talk to one another, not yeah. through the cloud. And the reason that they need to talk to one another well, is because of too. the applications. We believe that, too. We right. believe that for availability, that is absolutely... So true. in order to do that, you need programming models that are powerful that will allow you to do these kinds of computations. Right now, there is no programming, programming model. Models that I, well, this is getting to be you and me, but anyway, mm -hmm. programming models, the way I think about it yeah. is the ability to write a program, right. and then the system will now figure out where the computation happens, and whether it happens on the edge yes. or happens in the cloud. That's exactly what Foglet does. Yeah. So now we use that model, by the way. Okay, and that'll be interesting to see what the comparison between the two. Yeah. So basically, what, you, what we are saying is, you know, you want the ability to uh, continue the computation wherever is the most appropriate that uh, 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 in, the, in the context of uh, the micro data centers. If I have to move it to a different micro data center, that should happen automatically, not by the application. It reminds me of MASH, days we were doing mesh networking, grid systems, yeah. smart grids. You know, well, I mean, there's always, the I mean, computer science, we are, I mean, there is a, there's a, there's a, a, a saying that the problems um, uh, remain the, uh, 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 the same, but the solutions may be different. <laughs> uh, uh, so, in that sense, uh, I think you know some some of these things are not absolutely new 
right? But it is important to consider in order to do the kinds of things that we want to do. Um, because, you know, all of the things that I've heard today, for instance, are talking about uh, uh, analytics that is happening at the edge, uh, but there is no communication between the edge. And I'm saying that in the future, there's a lot more need for that with multiple, you know, um, uh, uh, connected vehicles and self-driving cars and so on. There is a need for lateral connection or horizontal connection, and that's what this programming model gives you. Okay. Um, and, and if you want more details of that, you can see it in this, in this reference. So the other thing that I want to talk about is, um, uh, is replication. And uh, so there is a, there is a, there is a um, um, uh, tension between consistency and latency. Uh, when it comes to replication in the cloud, um, uh, latency is not an issue because the replicas are there in the cloud in different racks, for instance, right? But here, when you're doing the replicas, um, uh, you want to put it in different places. So for instance, if I put all of the replicas close together in order to um, um, uh, optimize for latency, uh, then it'll, it'll result in very poor uh, fault tolerance. But on the other hand, if I have the replicas too far apart, then that's going to result in poor latency. So one of the things that we have done in this Fox tour work is we're saying that, well, let's first define a context of interest. So for instance, if I'm driving in, in uh, downtown Seattle, I need to know the traffic conditions close by. I know, don't necessarily need to know exactly the traffic conditions too far away. So, so I want strong consistency for things that matter to me immediately, and I'm perfectly fine with saying, well, uh, you give me uh, information about things that I don't necessarily need immediately in an eventually consistent manner. So that's the idea behind um, uh, what we call uh, um, uh, you know, the, this uh, uh, con con uh, context of interest, which is a region that you define as an application developer. And within that context of interest, I'm interested in knowing uh, we're having very strong consistency guarantees uh, for the reads and writes that I do, um, data access that I do. And, um, uh, and, and for things that are, uh, that are outside of the COI region, it's, it's perfectly fine if I have eventual consistency. I, I don't want to mess up your timing. But, yeah. uh, for something like this, right? we are, the maps applications today already provide this by going to a cloud. Don't they, in terms of traffic congestion and so forth? Why does it need... No, I'm just giving you that as an example of information that for which we need strong consistency guarantees and information for which we don't need strong consistency guarantees. And I'm saying that here is a mechanism that we have for doing that by saying, well, define for me a context of interest. So for instance, what happens in uh, many of the uh, cloud-based solutions right now is that they may have eventual consistency for everything. And the application has to figure out that, oh, there was a violation of strong consistency and then take corrective actions. You see what I'm saying? From the point of view of the congestion of vehicles here, I'm not saying why do you need strong consistency at all. Um, well, well uh, so, so the traffic, I'm saying, I'm saying that this may be not be the most appropriate example, but I'm saying there are situations where you need strong consistency guarantees. And there are situations which, in which you are perfectly fine with eventual consistency, right? And, and uh, right now, the way programming frameworks um, uh, in, the, in the cloud will let you do that is, well, you can say, here is, um, I need strong consistency guarantees, but the underlying system provides only, like Cassandra or whatever, provides only eventual consistency. And so what you do is, at the application level, you notice when there is a consistency violation and you take corrective action. I'm saying that this particular system says, you define a context of interest within that, I'll give you strong consistency guarantees. Outside of that, I don't give you strong consistency guarantees, but I give you eventual consistency. Make sense? Okay, so that's the idea behind that. And you know, uh, details of that, if you want, uh, you can see in this paper. And so the, uh, uh, the quorum always involves replicas that are in close proximity so that I can get uh, 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 get this uh, uh, low, uh, low latency with strong consistency. And, and for things that are distant, I will get uh, 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 um, uh, consistency eventually. So the other thing that we have done is, uh, is, is asking this question that, well, you know, um, uh, the capacity at the edge is limited. And, um, and in many of these applications, we are generating data 24-7. And, and so all of this data uh, has to be stored somewhere, and, um, uh, and, and there's pressure on the uh, capacity that may be at the, at, the, at the edge nodes. 
and, and there is also uh, burstiness, right? So if there is a, um, a, a ball game gets over, all the cars come out at the same time, there is a huge uh, uh, computational load on the edge server that may be close to that. And so these skews in the workload uh, uh, are another reason that you have to worry about how you do this uh, data rep replication in a capacity-conscious uh, uh, manner. And, and uh, uh, so, so, for instance, the older data, you can push it to the higher levels in the, uh, in the hierarchy, and, and uh, uh, the important data uh, that, that is um, uh, temporally relevant uh, can be kept close to the edge of the network. And um, so, uh, so that is the uh, uh, agile uh, load balancing that we have in the data fog uh, system. And, and basically what we do in this is uh, um, uh, we're using uh, geohash and consistent hashing to make sure that, uh, uh, that the uh, uh, data uh, replication is, uh, is distributed. So if, you, if you're familiar with Cassandra, it has a particular way of doing it. So what we did is modify Cassandra's uh, data distribution so that it takes, a, take, take, takes into account both the... Uh, 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 the um, uh, 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 geo coordinates and the, and the temporal coordinates um, in order to do this uh, 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 replication in a geo distributed manner that doesn't put uh, a burden on uh, a particular node while still making sure that it can satisfy the latency properties that we want. Um, and, and so that's uh, uh, part of what the data fog is. And, and if you're interested in that, uh, it appeared in the hot edge uh, uh, just recently. Um, so the, uh, the last thing, uh, maybe not the last thing, but how much, how, how much time do I have? Minute and a half. So I'll just very quickly say one thing that we've done is uh, we've said that, well, you know, can we actually use edge computing to record the trajectory of all vehicles all the time? Um, and, and, the, and the way we want to do that is, well, if I know the, uh, the camera deployment in a, in, in, uh, on the roadways, then I can say if, I, if a particular vehicle comes to my camera, then I know based on the trajectory of that vehicle and the camera's uh, positioning in the roadways, what are the next cameras that it can possibly go to? And so tell those guys that here is a signature that you might want to look for. And, and once that signature arrives there, then I can actually send my partial trajectory to that person and get rid of it. So that's the idea behind uh, uh, this uh, STTR system. And so the idea is you, 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 you notice that there is a, a particular vehicle that came by here, and I'm going to tell the node that is downstream that, uh, to look for that. And, uh, and it does a matching of the signature with the signature of the uh, vehicle that it, that it gets. And so now we've got, we've got the uh, trajectory of uh, this uh, uh, vehicle can be, can be passed over to this guy uh, so that I can get rid of this and, and uh, accumulate all of these. And over time, um, older uh, uh, trajectories uh, that, I, that, I, uh, that I recorded can be gotten rid of. So what we do is both forward and backward propagation of, uh, uh, of, um, uh, between the cameras in order to, uh, uh, to get this uh, 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 trajectory aggregation. And, um, and the storage is bounded by the activities within each camera. So in pr principle, what we are saying is we are, traje we are recording the trajectory of all vehicles all the time, not sort of post-mortem. But uh, the way we are able to do that is because we are not sh uh, uh, saving uh, the, uh, uh, the video, but actually the trajectory, and we are accumulating that. And I'm run out of time completely. So that's the idea behind STTR. If you're interested in that, again, you can see um, a, a paper that appeared uh, recently on that. Um, and the last thing is uh, a social sensing, and I'm going to, not going to say anything uh, more about that except to say that um, we can have network partitions, and even if you have network partitions, we can use other modalities. Uh, you know, I can use uh, Suman's um, uh, roaming, uh, um, what do you call it? Roaming edge uh, to to uh, to do that, and so these are things that you know. Once again, going back to what Victor you said, some of these things have been done in in, uh, in the past, right? Uh, uh, Darknet and things like that. So those are things that can actually come back again in the context of making sure that your uh, edge can be autonomous, even if you don't have cloud connectivity. So um, uh, and there's a paper that appeared recently with that. So so. I think we, we all agree that there is an inflection point in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, which is spurred by large-scale deployment of sensors and novel uh, applications, and, and uh, 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 Edge is emerging as a disruptive uh, technology. And, and, and my vision for the future is that uh, we have to make sure that the Edge can be autonomous. And how can we get to it? Okay, let me stop there. Yeah. Questions? Quick questions while Clara gets set up. 
Yeah. Why do you need to employ this heuristic of uh, if this cam if this car passed this camera, then there might it might probably will pass this next camera. Yeah. Why can't why don't you just save all cars that passed each camera in like common storage? Then you can just basically query it where this license plate has been over time, right? Yeah. So you, you don't need this. Well, what we're saying is, so your your question is. Uh, why are we why are we not just keeping the sightings in every camera? So in, in order to do the query, you know, what we want ultimately is a space-time tracker for a particular vehicle, right? I can actually get that because I'm already computing that, and I'm keeping it ready. So if there is a query that comes along, I can answer it quickly because I already computed the space-time uh, trajectory. Um, so a lot of times, what we do today is uh, ask the question: Oh, what happened to that particular vehicle at that particular time? You have to go and analyze video footage in order to figure that out. Here I'm saying that, well, you know, we can record the trajectory of all the vehicles all the, all the time so that you can make no, the query. But, but I can just record the, the fact that this car has been here. Just say you could do that. Story, right? it, so, so in fact, what we do is that the lazy aggregation that I said is just keeping it uh, where you cited it. Mm -hmm. And later on, we try to stitch it together. Um, but the point is that you know you could actually oversubscribe the storage in a particular uh, node, and that's the reason that we do this aggregation in order to reduce the storage requirement at a particular node. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kisho. Uh, next, we have Clara from uh, UIUC. Clara is a is a, is a director of the, the, the computer, uh, the coordinated science laboratory at uh, UIUC. Clara's work interestingly actually spans a whole bunch of network and systems as well as the multimedia video side of things. And uh, you know, again, she has a long list of, uh, of, of awards to her name, among them the Technical Achievement Awards from uh, SIGMM, as well as the IEEE Computer Society. And uh, yeah, today let's uh, hear from her on the on operator placement for yeah. streaming workflows. Okay, well, thank you so much. And uh, uh, it's my pleasure to talk to you about uh, uh, some of the work that um, we are engaged uh, uh, with my students and also collaborator Professor Gulo Aga. Uh, actually, one of the students, Atul, is here, uh, intern. Um, and uh, so I'm going to report some of the work that uh, we are doing uh, um, in, I think in this whole edge uh, cloud uh, uh, environment. And I think that today, the whole day, we have been hearing uh, very um, uh, good motivations, very good applications for IoT. Uh, and um, uh, so I think the applications are generating huge amount of data. Um, the data need to be processed and analyzed. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I do want to actually concentrate is that these particular data um, that are being generated from the IoT like cameras are uh, generating continuous streams that are then in need of analysis in timely manner. And so um, uh, we are actually going to be looking at uh, those kind of data streams. And we also today, whole day, have been talking about uh, um, how edge is being disruptive, that basically instead of having now cloud centric analytics uh, um, from the IoT devices, data are being sent to cloud and then analytics, we are actually putting edges uh, uh, in between to actually do analytics or at least part of the analytics uh, on the data um, and part of it basically being on the cloud. So, um, in, uh, as it was mentioned a couple of times now today, is that uh, basically without the edges, uh, we are seeing high latency, and particularly for some of the applications as Satya and as uh, Victor this morning, and as our keynote speakers were talking about, basically, um, uh, are sort of, so there are applications that are in need of very um, uh, high latency uh, improvements uh, and uh, to conservation of bandwidth and also privacy. And uh, so I think what is really needed is in some way start to think about how do the edges and the clouds actually collaborate. Um, uh, 
um, and divide in some way the analytics uh, uh, to actually yield these uh, demands uh, in um, uh, latency bandwidth and privacy and so on. Uh, one application that uh, I want to bring up is we work actually with OSF, which is the Order of San Franciscan uh, Hospital uh, in central Illinois, and um, uh, they actually have a very interesting application where uh, paramedics actually are going to homes. Very often, actually, they see uh, strokes, and uh, very often you actually can detect uh, the uh, strokes through some sort of drooping uh, uh, of the person. And uh, we actually work with Microsoft, Microsoft, we got HoloLenses, and are actually working with them to, to actually put the HoloLens on top of the uh, paramedic and what actually the doctors would like to see is uh, seeing the video of what the paramedics is seeing and then streaming that particular video to the hospital and then basically provide feedback, even if it's auditory feedback, but the best thing it would be on the AR um, uh, sort of display actually to see some feedback, don't move this, push this particular up and so on. So um, uh, I think very, very interesting application. We are having now a um, um, implementation and are going to be actually testing it um, in uh, Peoria. But what basically happens is that this uh, particular applications of the analysis of the video needs actually that um, a lot of sort of analysis of the video streams happen between actually the HoloLens or the uh, end, uh, end device, uh, then basically the ambulance and then the hospital. And so we actually envision that the traffic actually go, the video goes uh, to the ambulance, but the ambulance actually will have some sort of edge device uh, uh, and then it goes to the hospital where actually then it sort of sits on the cloud and the doctor might sort of see the result of some other uh, analytics. And very often actually this particular video will need to be uh, partitioned and goes through particular tasks, through particular operators like the face detection, uh, landmark detection, um, and then mouse drooping. And so you could actually imagine that uh, as the video is streaming from the HoloLens, it's basically going to the uh, edge device, that at the edge device the face detection operation happens and then uh, basically these particular two operations would happen uh, at, the, at the cloud. Um, so um, um, the systems architecture I think is... Uh, sure so you're saying the doctors want to see what the um, paramedic is seeing. Right. But then you're also saying that there's some processing is happening on the edge. Right, to help. So it's not, they're not seeing, the doctor not seeing streaming video, they're seeing the, the result of the processing that happened at the edge. They will see uh, the video, but also, for example, processing. Uh, so, for example, you Why do they need processing if, if they're seeing the video? The doctor should be able to right. right? Uh, well, uh, we are actually um, uh, anticipating that uh, maybe some sort of additional metadata would be helpful, uh, particularly uh, sometimes these uh, videos are, um, you know, there are family members and so on, so uh, to concentrate, so you could actually put a face uh, box around that. You could already put some kind of metadata for the doctor to identify some things that have happened. Um, another sort of un uh, interesting aspect is that the doctors actually would like to uh, also have certain um, um, uh, metadata stored in the cloud, what might have been the problem, right? So there is a sort of for insurance purposes. Uh, so I can imagine that there could be even almost like a concurrent aspect that you are actually beauty viewing the video. Why, why, do you need the, why do you need the edge there? Why not just, if you're streaming the video, you can just Right. Time. Well, we actually at this point uh, anticipate that there could be also some nurse already in the in the ambulance to basically help to actually work with the doctors preparing and operating, uh, you know, environment and so on. So, um, you know, actually, when you look at the current ambulances, they are high tech. 
right? I mean, they already have um, you know tremendous amount of equipment and so on. So um, the scenarios that we have been uh, you know sort of looking at uh, through their videos and so on is coming to the uh, apartment or to the house. Uh, the paramedic is looking at it, basically is trying to understand what what needs to be done. The in the ambulance you have might be another sort of nurse uh, that is already preparing something has to happen and so on and they actually could have already display and sort of helping them to identify certain things and then the video goes further uh, there are other there's very also interesting reasons, right? there's also regulatory reasons that might uh, prevent data being sent to the public cloud it has to remain within the no, no, it's, it's, it's just not really public cloud it can be just some computers sitting in the hospital. But I think I get the nurse example I get. The nurse, yeah. Yeah, because there you're sort of saying that this is an automated system. Uh, right. She needs some analysis. It sort of do, does the analysis, and then you also right. send the videos. Right. I mean, there is a sort of a distributed yeah. uh, processing um, but, uh, happening. Um, I mean, there are other very interesting problems, by the way. Uh, you go to rural Illinois, uh, basically you have, uh, you don't have to, uh, disruptive yeah. uh, internet, and then, and so basically the edge actually becomes a lifesaver, right? Uh, and so this is actually currently also another big problem. How much information do you carry in the ambulance? And as the ambulance is moving and the edge is actually mobile, you start to basically slowly upload data. And anyway, that's not what this talk is about, but uh, really interesting sort of space. Um, the uh, architecture that uh, we at this point are uh, sort of assuming is that on the cloud uh, there is some application manager, resource manager, operator, deployer, uh, and then there is sort of this placement service uh, that actually is getting um, uh, from the application um, a um, streamed uh, sort of description of the particular application, the, the application and data description. Um, I, um, uh, and of course, there is this edge that has a certain data flow engine. There is a cloud has a certain uh, cloud data engine, and they are basically managing uh, these various applications and, and data. Um, and so the control plane actually is that the camera stream basically specifies to the uh, cloud controller what kind of application and data description uh, is uh, uh, needed. Um, then basically the um, uh, application manager provides that particular information to the droplet service. Then the droplet service, uh, the, the placement service, as we will see, will do the placement where actually what operators, what task, what services should be in this workflow service placed on the uh, edges and on the cloud. Uh, and then the uh, operator deployer basically deploys those particular operator so that then these edges and cloud basically can be ready uh, to actually then take uh, the particular video streams and then basically stream them from the edge uh, to the cloud through processing of these various operators. One important aspect is that we are looking at video and the video actually you can sort of process one frame sort of at the time and so basically when edge is processing frame two, the frame one already can be uh, further processed by another operator O2 by the cloud controller. Um, and uh, the various microservices, the workers basically can be using, uh, can be used to process and run operator two, operator three over those particular uh, frames. So I basically want to talk about the placement. That's a really major goal uh, and the algorithms that I want to describe. There are a couple of really interesting problems of the placement and actually this morning the keynote speaker talked about some of the placement uh, of operations, operator services, tasks on um, your um, uh, on your edges and clouds. Uh, we are assuming that any applications, as many other um, speakers talked about, is represented as a, a graph, a task graph, or operator interdependent uh, task graph, and then actually you have these different compute resources, um, but uh, you basically need to decide you put uh, some basically task operators on the edge on the cloud and you can have very different types of combinations um, uh, depending on how many edges you have and what's your task graphs um, so the big challenge is actually dependent operators have to be placed 
on connected resources because there is a certain dependency. And um, for example, if you have an unidirectional uh, space uh, uh, in terms of the task graph, basically placing operator one in this dependency on the cloud and then putting operator two on edges uh, might not be really the best placement. So those are so some of these um, invalid sort of operations. Another challenge that we face in this placement space is uh, the um, uh, heterogeneity in the resources. So uh, many of these um, um, cameras might uh, basically have only two containers. So some of the tasks maybe could be processed on the HoloLens, but then basically on the edge device, you might have maybe four containers. And of course, cloud has a lot of resources. And so uh, understanding as we are assigning these operators to the various uh, uh, tier, uh, tiers you know, is important. Uh, to trade-off computation and communication delay. And then the last challenge that we do want to take into account is the whole video. I mean, we have been talking about uh, video processing, video analytics, and um, so the data is really coming through the continuous stream of observation, and it's really coming in, in the pipelining fashion. Um, we actually assume that every video stream has frames, and then the frames get divided into sequences. We already talked about, sort of people talk about chunks, uh, right? When you Think about Dash, some of these other protocols. So basically frames and then the, 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 these segments um, and the data are around 30 frames per second. And these frames are coming through the edge and to the cloud. And so in some way you could actually think about pipelining because uh, when cloud is processing already frame one on the uh, operator two, uh, frame two can actually process on the edge uh, uh, operator one and uh, you can actually do this particular uh, tasks concurrently. So um, this is uh, basically um, a really important challenge to model and uh, uh, explore this particular parallelism. So our approach um, in um, uh, solving these challenges is actually to uh, um, uh, look at the mapping of the uh, task graph onto these various containers and resources and um, uh, particularly explore as the video runs uh, the pipelining and the concurrency. So for example, operation 0102 can run concurrently or 0203 if they are placed, 0203 here could run in a pipeline. Um, and therefore basically you know, speed up your processing. So we need to basically jointly design the pipeline operations and the placement. So the analogy, in order to do this placement of uh, efficiently, particularly in sort of linear uh, space, um, we actually took the uh, example from the uh, matrix chain multiplication, which is a very well-known problem. If you have actually sort of here these four matrices to be, um, uh, to be multiplied, of course, associative uh, uh, property is, uh, and there is a polynomial algorithm exists to find the parent with the fastest execution time. And so here, for example, you have a matrix uh, uh, A, um, and if you do A times B um, times C, basically you have one billion flops uh, if you multiply A and B, and then actually when you multiply result of A, B with C, you get one million flops. On the other hand, uh, basically when you do a first uh, uh, B and C, um, you basically get uh, uh, one million flops, then you basically multiply uh, matrix of the hundred uh, thousand by thousand again together, uh, you will have one million flops. And so you can see actually you have only uh, two million flops uh, versus one billion plus one million flops. So we are going to be using the same thing in order to find the placement and um, on our operators. So the operators at this point, as a parenting, is going to be the pipelining. If you think about operator has the execution time uh, on uh, edge three seconds, on the cloud two seconds, and then the transmission time is one second on the operator two the same, uh, operator three the same. And now basically depending on how you place it, if I place basically separately sequentially 
operator one on cloud, operator two on cloud, but they are sequentially processing frame one, frame two, frame three, and so on, no pipelining. Your current total time to process is actually two times um, you know, on the cloud, two seconds time, 10 frames, and so on, it's 60 seconds. On the other hand, if I start to do certain parallelism, the pipelining on the edge and on the, uh, on the uh, cloud, you can basically very much speed up things. And the reason is that basically now O1, O2 are in parallel concurrently, and therefore you have 10 frames that are basically in concurrency sort of maximum of the three, time, three seconds, two second, and transmission second, plus actually um, uh, sort of processing the 10 frames uh, uh, on the cloud from the operator three. And of course, now you are seeing much more, uh, much less sort of um, the, the time. So the pipelining definitely helps. Yeah. So uh, you're making some assumptions about no cost for the network. Hmm. We do. Uh, we, we actually do assume also that there is, for example, this is currently the operation is one second, right? So we do add it uh, to between the edge no, and the so cloud. For example, like uh, if you were uh, on a flaky network or you're an LTE network, and uh, the amount of time it takes for you to communicate, right, that should play into the factor as well. Because if it's taking forever to communicate, you're better off uh, doing it right in the edge. Right. But as for us, well, it's not. So, and that changes all the time because congestion and network changes all the time. Right, so, yeah. I mean, this is at this point sort of more sort of the mathematical model that uh, we have been uh, trying sort of to uh, uh, understand actually how to place them. Um, then, sorry, oh, okay, so the other thing you're, is you're but, assuming there's no state transfer here. Right. I mean, there is data transferring, right. Now, there is a control plane, right, that um, exchanges uh, uh, the, the information all the time. But that is, at this point, uh, not uh, in this particular parenthesis. Um, uh, in, involved, but uh, that's a very good point that uh, uh, as we start to basically build the, the, this particular um, distributions of the congestions of the, of the delays and so on need to be sort of refined. Um, the big issue for us was uh, particularly through the finding these uh, placements uh, and the parenthesis, the, uh, the pipelining actually helped us to think about in a uh, more sort of efficient fashion where to actually put these operators for the video streams, right? Uh, because the video streams do get uh, placed, yeah, uh, get processed. So the uh, interesting aspect is that you could then start to have, if you have a one edge container and two cloud containers, uh, maximum part is three, you can start to actually put all kinds of configurations uh, together. Um, and um, this is, for example, that these two are in parallel, and then this is basically sequential, um, and so on. And of course, some of these configurations make no sense, some of them make sense, um, and that actually then uh, gets uh, removed. So I want to just sort of show um, that basically out of these configurations, you can build basically a placement graph and uh, then basically start to see basically which particular path of your graph and operator uh, placements make sense. And of course, the, if the links are having the execution time from source and communication time from source to destination, you can um, uh, then basically uh, uh, find the shortest path uh, to the solutions of the, of the placement. Um, and so here basically O1 is on the edge and O2, L3 are uh, on the cloud. Um, and of course you can have all kinds of capabilities of pruning, right? Uh, where basically, for example, you don't want the um, operator being on the edge, basically going back and forth with your video streams. So um, the evaluation I just wanted to um, uh, sort of show um, for this particular algorithm, uh, we wanted to care about uh, the, the, com the completion time, right? Depending on where you place uh, these, uh, um, these uh, operators, uh, edge and uh, uh, cloud, how many containers you have, and then time to find the placement. I think that's uh, really important, but particularly the completion of the process of the data chunk, uh, of the groups of, uh, yeah. So um, we compared it with various sort of known algorithms and uh, our 
or uh, actually algorithm sort of uh, is here, uh, performs sort of better than uh, this is sort of usually these optimal mobile offline algorithms. And these are some sort of other um, brute force, for example, uh, algorithms. But um, generally, if you look at number of operators, that's another big issue. For example, if you think about video uses deep, le deep learning, it's a huge number of operators, right? And so we need to think about as we are placing, you know, these operators can the algorithms, the, the placement algorithms deal with so many operators and our algorithms sort of better than the sort of, for example, the genetic algorithm uh, in terms of the completion time to find. One other thing is I want to just to brute force. Uh, after 13 operators, basically, this brute force just gave up. It was just too big. So for some of these video analytics uh, type of um, uh, operators, uh, uh, um, uh, task graphs, it's not very uh, feasible and therefore sort of again uh, our uh, droplets sort of work too very, very well. So in conclusion, I um, wanted just to talk about uh, um, an algorithms for placement, uh, utila actually finding an algorithms that is polynomial. I mean, that's a really big issue. Uh, how can you sort of speed up uh, uh, finding the right placements for between edges and the resources and the cloud and the resources for large number of, uh, uh, of um, operators? And there are a couple of sort of um, uh, comments I want to just make is so we actually presented this particular paper on the cloud uh, 2018. The particular um, teleconsultant uh, with the HoloLens uh, applications we presented um, demonstrated in ACM Multimedia. I also wanted to sort of specify some of the applications that we are also interested in video 360 and uh, 3D video. We actually have done some of the sort of smart um, gaming uh, and sort of a couple of years ago uh, with 3D video and I think that's going to be a very interesting application for uh, edge computing. The last thing I want to just encourage you uh, ACM MMSYS um, uh, is going to be in Amherst uh, uh, and um, uh, they are looking for special session, uh, call for proposals and so I thought maybe a um, uh, video edge uh, computing uh, could be a really, really interesting session uh, since we are talking about those uh, um, issues and uh, so I just wanted to advertise that. Time for one quick question. Um, what was the first publication on your publication slide? <sighs> yeah. So my uh, first publication was, so this was actually really, really interesting. This was HP Jornada. Does anybody remember what HP Jornada is? Oh, yeah. Hey, great. And that was actually, I would say, uh, offloading of uh, services to uh, a gateway. We didn't call it the edge at that time. This was actually done with HP, uh, and uh, uh, they actually um, uh, uh, sort of really told us, you know, a lot of video and, and sort of some of these complex applications we cannot process on HP Jornada. Let's offload it. And so, uh, but this was basically these services offloading and, and placement and so on. So I have been working with some of these placement services for. Uh, some time. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Jason. And uh, in fact, an interesting question that, that came up. I think Victor asked about stateful services on the edge, which actually is the topic of uh, Jason's talk. Uh, Jason is a professor at the University of Michigan, where he heads the uh, software systems laboratory. His, his interests are are uh, on all aspects of systems, and, and remarkably, he, his work has won best paper awards at all the major systems conferences from SOSP, OSDI, Mobises, ASPLOS. Did I miss something? Fast. Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, so, in, in contrast to a lot of the talks you've heard today, this is really early work that my uh, grad student, uh, Matt Furlong, and I have been cooking up over the summer. Um, so think of this as a hot foo talk. I, I'm really looking for early feedback on this work. Is this a good idea? Interesting applications and so on. Um, so in looking at, at the space of edge and particularly the, the offloading of, of computation 
uh, that is resource intensive to edge infrastructure, there, there's a set of applications that are kind of interesting and very poorly supported. Uh, these are applications that have the following characters. They're latency sensitive, as Victor said. They're stateful. Um, and also those that have users that are mobile, maybe even highly mobile, like in a vehicle. Now, latency sensitive applications we've seen from Cloudlets as a one of the justifications for edge computing. Um, but you know, we're seeing more stateful applications due to personalization and context. And we've seen in Suman's talk, uh, we have to support users that, that are moving around the infrastructure. So uh, in the vehicular space, there's a lot of applications that fall into this category. Augmented reality applications are providing information or assistance to the driver. Um, for example, if you're in a caravanning application, and you are going to a common destination, maybe highlighting a vehicle that you are traveling with or following, a parking spot finder that will give you directions to a parking lot or highlight that parking lot or enhance turn-by-turn -turn directions and so on. All these applications meet these characteristics, but the current edge infrastructure that we're talking about often doesn't support these applications very well. So why is that? Well, one challenge derives from mobility. So we want, to put, we want to put our applications on the edge because we have low latency to that edge infrastructure. But if users are moving, that means proximity is going to change. So when I drive to another town, I may no longer be proximate to uh, the edge infrastructure that I had previously. I may be more proximate to edge infrastructure that is in the town that I'm driving to. And that implies that I need to start using different edge infrastructure or for stateful services, that implies that I have to migrate my computation. And migration of stateful services implies downtime. And for a lot of those applications, that means the application is not useful for a long period of time, uh, especially if we don't have really strong connectivity like we have in the data center between our edge infrastructure. Um, and the amount of state that we're migrating is fairly large. Another challenge is um, uneven conditioning in the edge infrastructure. So there's a lot of work, including from my own students, that have shown that wireless networks can exhibit a lot of variation that is hard to predict on a second-to-second -second granularity in terms of the, the latency to edge services. Um, it is also the case that there's uneven conditioning when we have limited resources and we're sharing those resources between uh, different applications. So if an application starts to demand more resources, we're sharing with another application, uh, those applications will see variation on the granularity of seconds. And if our, our, our deadlines are in, in, if we care about latency, that means that we're going to see uneven behavior from those applications. And we need to deal with this kind of inherent variability. And then uh, the final challenge is a little bit more traditional. Um, we, we need reliability. And edge services, at least in the short term, may wind up being less reliable than cloud just simply because of the difficulty of physical maintenance, maybe because we're also sharing those resources with a primary provider, for example, put placing edge services in a telco at, at, at a cell tower. So we'd like to be able to fail over these services to the cloud, maybe provide degraded services, we can do this fairly easy for a stateless service, but for a stateful service, if we lose our state unpredictably, we have the problem that we're going to see a discontinu discontinuity, discontinuity in the application itself. So what can we do? Well, if we were talking about stateless services, then replication is actually an answer for all of those challenges. We can instantiate multiple copies of our service, let's say a speech recognition service or a, a completely stateless face recognition service in multiple replicas, and we can address each of these challenges. So if I need to migrate an application, instead of, instead of just simply stopping one, migrating, and, and, and starting another place, I can start up another replica. While it's starting up, I can continue to use the old replica. I can switch over to the new replica, even test them out, see which one is working better. And then when I decide that that replica is working better, I can degrade the old one. So I can use migration. Instead of using migration, I can use replication to hide that downtime. I can mitigate jitter by essentially broadcasting my request to multiple replicas using a response that comes back faster. And of course, replication is traditionally used to provide reliability through primary backup or other forms of fault tolerance. But all these solutions that I've described so far assume stateless services. And state breaks everything. 
So imagine I've got my simple parking spot finding finder that has picked out a parking spot for me and is providing either highlighting that parking spot or giving me arrows in the parking lot guiding me to that parking spot. Works great, except if I am starting to replicate my service, I could now have two replicas, one that picks out parking spot A to my left, another that picks out parking spot B to my right. If I start sending my request to multiple replicas, either one would be fine. The first replica would guide me to the left, the second replica would guide me to the right. But if I mix the responses from the two of them, then I'm going to get this annoying case of go left, go right, go left, go right. It's not going to work. Um, so mixing the responses from the different replicas is going to break these stateful services. And so we know how to deal with this in, 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 uh, in systems that do replication in the cloud, like Paxos, consensus services. And that is we assume determinism. We provide very simple services, and we make those services deterministic. If I provide a determinism for my uh, stateful service in the cloud, like the parking spot example, all would be good. If I ran the application and it was completely deterministic, that means that given the same set of inputs, it's always going to provide the same outputs. Then what would happen is no matter what replica, I, I, they would both pick A. Um, and no matter what replica I asked, it would provide me guidance to A. And it wouldn't really matter which one, because they're guaranteed to give me back the same output. So there are a couple of, there are a couple of ways that I could achieve this property determinism to get the benefits that I talked about previously. Sanjay. So, uh, even with cloud services, don't you have to worry about stateful services and failures? And how are they handled? Why don't those techniques work? So, the, so there are a couple of different ways. Um, generally, the way that we would do this is by, by putting the things that we really care about in, um, in, a, in using a protocol like Paxos to keep them consistent um, and to use a, or to use a, a replicated store. The, the difference here is that I don't necessarily, I want to I be able to have completely independent replicas. And the reason for this is because of the uneven conditioning. In other words, I want to be able to send requests to multiple replicas and have them send me back a, a, a consistent response without communicating with one another. So I want them to be a priori deterministic as opposed to enforcing that determinism through a protocol that involves communication between those replicas. Does that make sense? Because if they have to communicate, then, then, then they're not, I'm not going to get the latency that I need. Because, because the communication between those nodes is going to eliminate the benefit the, uh, at the millisecond granularity of, 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 of what I'm getting here. So if I was in a data center, they were very close together, and they had, you know, I, I could do that. But I'm, actually, but I'm assuming edge infrastructure here. And are you protecting against failure of entire edge data centers, or are you protecting against failures of servers within one edge data center? I am in the in the in the case that I talked about for fault tolerance. I'm really just thinking about my instead of having my my personalized service deployed on one node, I'm going to have a backup running in the cloud. So it's pretty much that in that case, I'm really just talking about primary backup fault tolerance. Yeah, Landon. Are you assuming that all the inputs are coming from the the car? These are this is sensor data. So basically, it's a single writer. They can serialize all the updates. You just send them out in parallel. They're all going to be applied in the same order. And so aren't you done at that point? Well, well, no. I think they're, they're actually, so, so I, I, I think there are a lot of sources of non-determinism that, that I'm going to talk about later. So let, let, you're actually sort of segueing into my, into my thing. So what I would like to do, so one thing I could do is I could write to a very restrictive programming model. And, and I could construct my applications in a very stylized way or using an infrastructure that restricts them enough so they are deterministic by default. But there are just a lot. But what I really want to do is I want to be able to take applications and deploy them on the edge without thinking about determinism and, and thinking about replication. So there are a lot of sources of non-determinism that an application may have. Timing. So for example, not just the values of inputs, but the order in which they arrive. Multi-threading, because most of the applications that are interesting nowadays will going to have to be, want to be able to use parallel resources. 
Um, just simple things like reading random numbers. The application itself may not use random num may not use random numbers, but it might use a library that, for example, does hashing, and the hashing library happens to generate random numbers. Communication both between the edge and the mobile and between the edge and resources located in the internet like the cloud. So all these are sources of non-determinants. So, so rather than trying to restrict the model of the application and force programmers to, to write to a, to a limited model, I'm going to try and make that model as general as possible and take applications that are already written and port them in, into this edge infrastructure. So uh, the system that we're, that we're just tinkering around with now, I think it, I wouldn't say building at this point, is called Ghost. And the idea is system support to make these edge services deterministic and then replicate them automatically. So we're going to make some assumptions, because we have to make some. Um, so the first is that the application has already, partition, already been partitioned so that some component that's user-facing runs on a mobile device and some components being offloaded to edge infrastructure. We're going to assume that the portion that's being offloaded is in a container. So we use containers at the edge. Common uses are for manageability and isolation. But we're going to use the container as the unit of determinism. So everything that happens within the container is deterministic. Things that happen on the edge infrastructure outside the container may be non-deterministic. Was that a question? I do have a question. So yeah. uh, if you make this uh, assumption, the second one, where you're saying some component runs on the edge and some runs in the cloud. So you are right away assuming if you lose connection to the cloud, you've, you lost it. You, the applications are not going to run. Is that I'm, right? assu I'm assuming that if you lose network connection entirely, the application will not run. That, it, that is correct. But it doesn't have, have to be the cloud. It just has, there has to be, I'm, I'm assuming the application is partitioned. You could imagine building in some form of disconnected operation in degraded mode, but my assumption is then the application is using those edge resources for some reason. It doesn't have, if it could do everything locally, it just would. And well, so and you, you, could, you could argue it, it uses edge resources to run faster or you know, do more heavier computation. But it, that, that is, isn't isn't, isn't, didn't we just say the same thing? So it, it's but using it no, to be better, no, and you can go back into a greater mode where it's worse, right? Well, yeah, but the point is that, yeah, so are you allowing that? Let me ask you, are you allowing, allowing degraded mode of operation on the client when you lose connection with the cloud? I don't think I've thought that far yet on this project. I, I, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't do that, why you, why you inherently, why this wouldn't allow it. It's, it's not necessarily something that I'm thinking about as, as part of this. It's just orthogonal. He's not talking about going to the cloud, though. He's talking about going to the edge. No, no I know, but when you break the connection to the edge, what happens? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, so, Jason, that becomes very hard, by the way, because we thought about this quite, quite, quite a lot, because then, when I, I'll give you an example. So uh, I go to Amazon to uh, pay with credit card, yeah, right? I lose the connection, correct, to the edge. Now the edge just know what, whether this has happened or not happened, right? And then you continue, uh, uh, then you stop because you've lost the connection. Then you start up. Um, then you turn, turn this thing on. So now you don't know if I actually pay, if, if the money has been charged, not charged, you know, where you are. In oh, the oh, oh, so, so you're talking about failure transparency. Yeah, that, that, is, that is something that this, we haven't gotten that far, but that is something that we want to get with this architecture. Determinism actually gets you a long way there because you, if, your app, if, your, if, your, if your operation is, is, is item potent, you can, you, can, you can do it again. If it's not, you can ship the log of operations and, and the operations uh, will produce the same result because the computation is deterministic. So um, in, in inherently, I have to think about the example that, that you gave me specifically, but that, that is a goal that, that we would have failure transparency if the edge infrastructure failed. I thought your connection was, what if you lose your network connection entirely? And if, if, if that's the case, yeah, you have to fail back to disconnected operation. Um, but, the, but the goal is if you don't lose, the, if you don't lose it entirely, that, that, the, that the failure would be transparent. Yeah, I had a quick question. Do you assume that this, partition is, uh, this partitioning is static? The sense, uh, can I would, would it would it function if, if I move components from the to, from the device to the edge or something like that? Um, for now, yes, but I I don't. 
you, you could you could do something Maui like, and I don't think it would change this too much. As long as the decision, as long as the partitioning decision was being made in a central place, like the client, I, I don't see any reason that wouldn't work. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. Oh, great. Five minutes. Um, okay. So there's some some assumptions here. It's weird. You ask the question and wait. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like it's like I you just lost five minutes with I I lost five minutes with that answer. If I gave a good answer, I would have gotten another five minutes. Okay. So what types of what? How do we enforce determinism? Um, there's actually been a, a a a fairly decent body of work in enforcing determinism for multi-threaded programs, and we're simply going to leverage that work to provide. Uh, deterministic um, to provide deterministic operation um, for the interest of efficiency um, we're going to assume that programs are data race free supporting programs with data races and making the deterministic has proven to be very challenging on the other hand some of the work that I've won with the deterministic replay has shown that it's actually fairly straightforward to take applications nowadays and make them data race free because of the existence of tools like thread sanitizer and so on um, for the things like the operating system that generates all sorts of unique non-deterministic identifiers, we can leverage the container virtualization and a deterministic algorithm for generating those identifiers. Um, time is actually interesting. I'm not quite sure how we're going to tackle this one yet. Applications as, in their unmodified form look at time a lot. One idea is to note that, that if we take the interaction between the edge and the client, we can look at each each request and response is a discrete chunk of time. And for many applications, we can have the client declare the start and the end of that chunk. And then within that time period, we can use a deterministic algorithm to generate time within, say, those 30 milliseconds or so, based on things like instructions executed and system calls and so on. I think this will work for a lot of applications. There are some applications it's going to fail horribly for. You can think of some pathological applications. So we probably need an escape hatch to say this is now non-deterministic and to have the infrastructure deal with that in, in, in some way. Um, and then network communication, which is something that, that Landon asked about. Um, between the client and the edge, we're going to have a client proxy that is responsible for, instant, for knowing which replicas are out there and making sure the same requests are going to replicas. And we're going to allow a pipeline series of requests and responses for the edge in the cloud, we're going to do something similar. We're going to have a proxy in the cloud that knows that if I have n replicas instantiated and they're deterministic, they're going to generate n requests. They're all going to be the same, so I can use the first one. And it can take responses to those requests, communication to the proxy, and multiplex them with the caveat that that has to be delivered in the same place in the execution of the, of, 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 of in the container's execution. So a natural place to do this would be allow communication at the beginning of each request or the end of each request being received from the client. Um, OK, so putting it all together, how might this work? I'm driving my car. I'm using my parking. I'm, I'm, I'm using a parking finder. Or I'm playing a, a game in the back seat, something that's using edge services. As I move, my, my latency becomes a little bit uncertain um, to the edge service that I was using. And so I can proactively say, maybe there's a better one out there, instantiate another replica, bring it up to speed, start using it, and then just simply use which one gives me the faster response time. So if I'm getting a lot of variation, two replicas are going to decrease my jitter, and, and I'm going to get a much better application experience. And for replication, once I have two replicas, I can always put a third one in the cloud. It doesn't matter that this one doesn't give me the best response time. It's going to provide that failover that, that Victor was talking about previously. But supporting this low latency it requires a little bit of thought that we haven't done yet. Um, so why won't this work? One thing that's challenging is in order for these replicas to catch up, if a replica is slow, it needs some idle time. If you're running the replicas at 100% of, the, of their capability and a replica falls behind, it's never, ever going to catch up. And so you need some amount of idleness or some amount of additional resources that are available for catch up for this idea to work. Um, one thing, reminiscent of Sanjay's talk, is to maybe we can automatically provide a fast path that only updates the state and doesn't do any other work associated with, for example, providing a response to the client in order to allow replicas to catch up faster. And maybe we can use some compiler techniques to generate that automatically. 
Another limitation is I, I would like to not restrict the programming model at all, but I've already made some compromises. It has to be race free. There are going to be some system calls that aren't going to be supported because I don't know how to do it. And there are going to be some pathological threading and time-based programming models that just won't work. And so figuring out the space of applications this works for is something we're going to have to do. Um, we do have some results. We, we, we have um, everything except for the time-based determinism working. We, we, we implemented a vehicle tracking application, a simple one with OpenCV. Uh, we wanted to measure the overhead of non terminus execution. Um, it was challenging because our application got faster. Why did it get faster? It's because OpenCV has a really, it had a kind of a crummy locking model with some hybrid locks that weren't very efficient. And we replaced them with deterministic locks and they got a little bit faster. So the main message here is that the overhead for, for you know, applications we looked at hasn't been too bad so far. Um, migration downtime, um, well, the application is pretty much continuously available if you instantiate a new app, if you instantiate a new replica in the background. So for a couple of applications, vehicular tracking, the face recognition similar to the one that, that Satya presented, um, we can migrate that application with no perceived downtime. Um, okay, so this is really early work. I'd be curious to hear your questions and whether this is a good idea, whether this is a bad idea, um, and whether we should continue working in this area. So think of this as a hot edge talk. Um, once we do this, I, it opens up a really interesting po set of possibilities for resource allocation because now instead of deciding where do we put a replica, we decide how many replicas do we want to put. And for example, it becomes a cost-benefit analysis of given the jitter, given, given, my, given what I've seen for response times the replicas I have, does it make sense to instantiate a new replica or should I save costs by taking a replica away somewhere else? So it's a, it's a different resource allocation decision. Okay, take questions. Thank you. Let's take one Rajesh, question before I guess. we head to the break. Uh, so one two. questions. Well, what would be, two questions. I'm still trying to figure out what's the <laughs> app for this, right? I mean, are there a lot of apps where if you give them the same input, they give you significantly different outputs? Well, so for example, tracking is a good example of this. Um, it, 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 because it's multi-threaded, because there are all these inherent versions, because there, they, because there are inherent sources of non-determinism and it's stateful, you, you actually see, you can actually see replicas diverge given the same tracking general input. I'm sorry? The tracking of what? Is it tracking? tracking of vehicles. So, you're, so the example here, the one that, that my student implemented was a caravanning application where you say, I want to follow my friend. And, and the friend's vehicle is, is essentially being highlighted. So the issue with determinism here is the data stored in the server from previous computations. Yes. Well, that's the state. And the issue with determinism is the fact, in this case, that it's multi-threaded. And the order of locking means that the, it, may, it may return a different result. Yes? Would it return a meaningfully different result? Would it get the bounding box slightly off, or would it identify like a completely different car? Um, in what we've seen, it can it can it can it can, it can lose the car. So, and, and once it loses a car, could it identify a different car? Theoretically, <laughs> well, the but but did it? No. Well, losing the car is a significant divergence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm wondering how you bring up the replica up to speed. So like, is it like a back? You, you take a snapshot of the first one and then start giving it the new inputs, or you, you start from the scratch and you pass all the inputs from the beginning of the execution of the first replica? No, you snapshot it and you bring it up. You bring it up to speed in the snapshot. So you use all the standard migration techniques that like pre-copy and post-copy to get the replica there. But you're still a little bit behind, and you have a latency-sensitive application that's stateful. So you still have to catch it up. This is where the catch-up speed matters, though, right? Because if, if I can only catch up five milliseconds for each frame, it's going to take me a long time to catch up. Maybe this is uh, ignorance of what, my understanding of what you're trying to do. So if I, you're saying that there's a state machine. How do I create a deterministic state machine? And I can create n copies of that state machine, and I feed them the same input, I get the same output. Is that? Yeah, what I'm trying to do really is but, take... But you're trying to say, create a deterministic state machine, some arbitrary code using... I mean, they're, if they're taking locks, you want to have them take the locks in the same way. Basically, yeah, I'm if I'm able to code a state machine, irrespective of you know, which language I use, I'm, if I get some input, I create the same output. 
I mean, programmers do that today. Right. What I'm trying to do is give you, I'm trying to let you write your program and convert it into a deterministic state machine while imposing as few restrictions on you as possible. So, for example, one of the big problems with with determine with with um, you know consensus systems is it, it it's kind of open. How you know if you wanted to have a multi-threaded service that you were replicating, that's that's kind of a no-no. There's been some work at Michigan and some other places looking at how to do this. Um, that's one dimension of terms that might challenge you, but communication with the cloud, there, there all those other dimensions would challenge you. Even if you can convert it to you have to feed them, I think maybe that was the question, you have to feed them the inputs in the same order, otherwise they will diverge again. So who yeah. is establishing the order of the inputs? You need some other consensus to say, <coughs> unless it's a single producer. But from, the, from, from the client, it, from the client so there, the, the, client, the client is a single producer, and then right. from, from other yes, sources, yeah. the cloud is a single producer. I think that, the, no, but going back sources. to the parking example, you know, if the state machine is maintaining which spots are uh, occupied, which spots are available, and which spots are occupied. If that is the state machine I'm trying to maintain, I can say the two spots available, and right. two, both the replicas say two spots are available, and one guy may say give one spot. But there's only one spot right. available. One guy might give one, and the other guy might give another. No, one. That, that is that is completely valid. So this is why the communication in that case you're probably talking in the cloud would sequence through another proxy in the cloud that is issuing one request, getting the response back, and then broadcasting that to the replicas. I see. And, and not only do you have some order has yeah, to be established. Right? Yeah, not only do you have to have the same order, but it also has to arrive at the exact same point in the computation sure. of, of those replicas. And so that's the other thing that, that, that's going did on you, there. Did you just say now you need some semantic knowledge of the application at this point? I mean, you, you no, 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 I, uh, no. Uh, you I, have you know, this global coordinator? No, but but it doesn't require semantic knowledge because it's all network messages, right? It's, it's requests and responses. But you have a global coordinator now, which is going to say either you have a single producer yeah. or yeah, a coordinator. Yeah, yes, I yes, I have a global coordinator, but no, that doesn't require semantic sure. knowledge. Okay, good. It does. It does require. You know, it does require some restrictions to sure. the model, which is what I talked about. So, okay. cool. Thank you for the feedback. <laughs> Let's take a brief five minute break and then come back for the last session on devices. Any thoughts on stateful networks?